see my screen pretty well right now. Um, apologies if any of the code might end up being small. Uh, sometimes go to meeting tends to go weird, uh, do weird things. Uh, going from like a 27 inch screen to other size screens. Uh, so this morning we're going to be talking about the uh, upcoming release for uh, uh, the OS GoDroid project. Um, so we're going to take a look at what's new, uh, what's improved, and we're also going to look at uh, the project roadmap going forward. Um, we're also going to talk about different ways uh, to potentially contribute if you're interested in doing that as well. And so probably don't have to do much of an introduction since uh, Kate did a great job. Um, so we can kind of skip this one. Uh, so what's the GoDroid project all about? So GoDroid is, um, pays homage to projects such as WebGoat, uh, the original WebGoat, WebGoat.net, um, all within the same group. Uh, so basically GoDroid aims to help developers, security teams kind of wrap their head around uh, various Android application security issues. Um, and as we talk about the project roadmap, we'll see that, you know, GoDroid's kind of ex going to expand beyond just supporting uh, Java and, you know, the standard Android build environment. And we're actually going to start looking at other frameworks and also integrating other technologies into the platform as well. Um, certainly wouldn't advise running GoDroid uh, on any production systems. It's, it's intentionally vulnerable everywhere. Um, we made absolutely no attempt to make it secure. So... Uh, friendly disclaimers, you probably shouldn't run this on a uh, web-facing box. Um, everything within GoDroid is open source. Uh, it's all licensed under GPL v3. Uh, so you're free to use it, um, extend it as you want, as long as you give the code back to the community. Um, and by the way, uh, one, we'll take questions uh, at various stopping points between transitions between sections. Uh, so if you have questions, please feel free to ask them and then we'll just answer them as they get queued up. Uh, so right now GoDroid is um, full of bugs. Uh, realistically, probably about two weeks out from uh, the 1.0 release. Um, so we're plucking out bugs. Actually did a lot of code revamp. Uh, definitely wrote some spaghetti code a few years ago, so we, we got a lot of that stuff out of there. Uh, beefing up the documentation. Um, so in the initial releases, one of the, the weak points of the project was um, we had a lot of cool bugs. Uh, we kind of hoped that people would essentially end up writing the documentation for us through various blog posts and whatnot. Um, so if you would Google for it, you'll see some people have actually found some of the some of the bugs. Um, definitely haven't seen all of them documented, so we're we're working towards that now. Um, additionally, we're also adding a phone gap application, so. Um, phone gap application adds quite a different attack surface to what you kind of see in native applications and we thought it would be a good place to start just given the fact that uh, phone gap is really popular these days. Uh, so if you want to contribute to this, there's actually several ways you can do it. Um, one way is obviously contributing code. Um, so if you're interested in building some additional modules uh, for things that may not be there right now that you'd like to see supported, uh, feel free to go for it. Um, if you're not a developer and you want us to build a few, that's that's perfectly fine. If you submit feature requests, um, we'll make sure that they get in there at some point. Uh, reporting bugs is also really important. You know, we'll find a bunch of them, but the rest of you are going to find the rest of them. And last but not least, help spread the word. So uh, developers should know about this. Security teams should know about this tool. Pretty much anybody that has a vested interest in Android security. Uh, should probably touch this at some point. Uh, so let's talk about what else is new in, in the 1.0 release. Um, so we've definitely beefed up the documentation. Um, in the original release, we kind of gave you clues to where things were, but not necessarily the actual uh, you know, treasure chest of where they are, uh, uh, treasure map rather. Um, so we've gone ahead and, and actually thoroughly documented each of those areas. Uh, we talked about the phone gap app. Um, actually abandoned it for, for those of you that used the earlier release, um, happened to stumble upon the swing GUI. Uh, it was actually really painful. It was really ugly and just wasn't fun to, to extend. Uh, so we scrapped that in favor of a web application. So now it should make it a lot easier to contribute and actually add new content as we go. Uh, other important things there, so we're also, you know, looking at 
um, new lab exercises for the more recent versions of Android, which you know may potentially change security model around in some ways, um, based on uh, earlier versions. For example, certain, uh, for example, a content provider um, in newer versions isn't automatically exported, so we've built exercises to kind of you know touch on those things. You know, if you're supporting older versions of Android versus new, um, just kind of showing you where the differences are in terms of security issues. And so we support the OS top 10 mobile risks within GoDroid right now. Um, as I always encourage everybody, definitely don't stop at 10. So uh, the top 10 is certainly a great awareness document. Um, it gives developers at least you know, somewhere to start, but it's certainly not what you should build your security program around, and it's certainly not what you should be telling your developers to only focus on. So we actually have things inside of GoDroid that venture outside of the top 10, and I'd encourage you to do that as well. Uh, so getting started and up and running with GoDroid. Uh, so we've approached it in two different ways. Um, compared to, say, for example, something like WebGoat, um, which you pretty much you know, go lesson by, you know, uh, module by module, uh, we kind of try to give users of GoDroid two different options. Um, you know, one way you could, you know, take the, uh, the guided route and do you know, the lessons will tell you exactly where to go um, and it'll tell you exactly what you're looking for and if you really need the solutions, um, which we'd hope that you'd at least try to solve some of the problems yourself, but if you get stuck, um, the solutions are there to save you. Uh, the other option is to just simply just dive into the applications. Uh, don't bother using the guide and lesson format. Um, and then, you know, once you kind of get to a stopping point, you know, go back and see um, what you didn't find, which would probably usually be an interesting exercise. Uh, so prerequisites for getting started. Um, you really don't need much outside of GoDroid. Um, so GoDroid embeds the web server. It embeds the database. Uh, all that stuff's there except for the Android SDK, um, Android ADT, which integrates with Eclipse. And um, you're going to need Maven as well to build. If you're going to actually build it from um, your IDE and run it, then you're also going to need Maven as well to pull in the dependencies. Uh, so getting started is actually extremely simple. Um, so you basically uh, going to go in the GoDroid folder and you simply double click the GoDroid.jar file. And it magically opens everything up for you. Um, but today we're going to run it out of Eclipse um, just so we can set breakpoints and, and kind of take a deeper look at where we're going. Um, so let's launch the GoDroid GUI. Um, so pretty much once you start it, all you're going to do is go to your web browser and you can see we already have it open. Um, and that's pretty much it. So you're going to go to port 12,000 in your browser and you'll see, uh, so this looks a little bit different than the Swing GUI that we had before. Um, so you have each one of the applications. You have the two native applications and then the phone gap application and the associated exercises. So um, we're still plugging in the content to some of these, but just to kind of give you an idea of what it looks like at this point. Um, so if we were to browse here to, let's look at cross-site scripting, for example. Um, so each exercise is going to have a description now. Um, it's going to have the actual, you know, the bug. Uh, solution code, and then if you just want a hint but you don't actually want the solution, um, you'll be able to click here and it'll give you, you know, little tidbits to hopefully get you a little bit closer to where you want to be. Um, other things of significance in the, in the front end, uh, configuration. Um, so this is where you're going to set, um, this is actually going to automatically update um, in the 1.0 version, where it should attempt to auto-detect your SDK path and it should auto-detect um, your virtual devices, depending on what uh, OS you're on. Um, the other parts, so uh, the UI web port and then the web service port, um, there's default values, but if you want to override those, um, you can do so easily from here in the configuration. Um, and that's pretty much it for the uh, front end. We have a few tools we're migrating from the Swing version um, to be able to send uh, the location, to be able to send a phone call, and to be able to send SMS messages. Uh, these are just simply wrappers for, uh, believe it or not, Telnet. Um, and these were also supported pretty well already in um, uh, Android's uh, DDMS. You have the option to do these things as well. But we just 
figure we put them there is just a kind of convenience tool um, if you're you know using it in a classroom environment. Uh, so yes, uh, getting started is is really 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 easy. So you pretty much just click on uh, that jar file, and everything's there. So if you would happen to look on the class path. Um, you'll see that there's all these things are actually uh, within the jar. So um, you have a databases folder, and uh, you have the databases under there. And here's all your Spring configuration stuff. So when you actually start that jar, um, everything is actually uh, built along with it. Uh, any questions so far uh, before we start diving into some of the uh, the nitty gritty stuff? Okay. No, no questions so far. You're doing a great job, Jack. Okay. Uh, so as we mentioned, uh, the web front end before was was Java Swing uh, GUI. Uh, it was definitely a bad choice. Like I kind of knew it after I released the initial version. Um, so I was eventually hoping to circle back and and migrate everything to, over to a web app. Um, but we did talk about this a little bit. So just know that the front end is where you basically, if you're going to contribute. Um, you're pretty much just going to plug your content in there and pointers to your application and then everything should magically work. Uh, so right now in terms of application support, um, so in the initial versions we had the Four Goats application and Herd Financial. So Four Goats is a location based social network. It's, it's a blatant ripoff of uh, Foursquare. Um, and in the 1.0 version we're working on the PhoneGap version of that. Um, so it leverages the same RESTful web service, um, except that it's obviously using PhoneGap instead of just you know native views to build the application, which means you're also building your application in HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript. And that also means that um, you potentially inherit uh, all the problems of the web within your mobile application. So it's a really interesting way to see how both of those worlds are kind of blended together. Uh, but the good news is that uh, we've already written the web services for you, so if you want to contribute to this project, um, you don't really have to focus much on server-side development. You could just write in an application that consumes the web service, um, or you could write code that doesn't consume any web service and just you know shows examples of uh, you know poor programmatic practices on the, on on an Android application. Uh, so it made it a lot easier going forward to contribute, uh, which was definitely one of the roadblocks in the first couple versions of the app. Uh, so let's take a look at some demos. We'll give you an example of some of the vulnerabilities that are there, um, but we definitely hope that you would dig in a little bit deeper and, and, and find a lot of this stuff yourselves. Uh, so the first one, um, we'll take a look at insecure uh, data storage. So we're actually going to fire off um, the Four Goats application here. this one up. Uh, so by the way, for those of you that are using the, the Android emulator to do your testing and development, um, definitely recommend uh, Jenny Motion. Uh, it's definitely a lot faster and um, it'll save you a lot of the headaches of, of using the standard uh, Android emulator. Uh, if speed is your thing, of course. Uh, so let's go ahead and relaunch that under here. Okay, so you can see uh, same pretty uh, UI. Um, I actually didn't build the, the UI to this. Uh, another gentleman named Walter did. Uh, so he actually approached me, um, looked at the, uh, the, the UI in the original version. So it was pretty much uh, just taking data and stuff it into, into list views. And I guess he felt a little bit of pity for me and he said, hey man, I'll go ahead and you know basically revamp it, build in the action bar and all the pretty stuff. So any of the prettiness that you see within these applications, please don't attribute any of that to me because other people did a good job building that out. So I'm sorry, did I hear something? No. Mm -mm. Okay. 
So the first thing you're going to do when you get inside of the application, um, I've actually gotten a, a ton of issues like uh, submitted about this. Um, it's, it was actually there in the Getting Started Guide. Uh, so the first thing you're going to want to do is go in and set the destination info. Uh, so basically what this is doing is setting the remote server where it's at. Um, because if you were to set this to the loopback, then it's actually going to point right at um, the Android uh, emulator instance itself. So you actually want to point at the IP address of whatever particular host uh, where the web server is actually listening. So in this case, um, it's uh, 1.3, and um, we're actually going to use port 10,000. Uh, additionally, so the proxy host and the proxy port. So within when you're testing an Android application, you generally have a couple ways, a couple different ways to get the application to actually go through your proxy. So one way is to actually build it into the HTTP client classes, which we did for this for the purpose of this application. Um, so you can look in our REST client, for example. Um, there's just a simple hook here into the HTTP client um, where we set the proxy. And then whenever HTTP requests are made, it automatically goes through our web proxy. Uh, so that's one way to do it. Um, the other way to do it is there's several applications if you're working on a rooted device. Um, one of them I'd recommend is ProxyDroid, uh, really handy, just sets basically some IP tables rules and allows you to push your stuff through a proxy. Um, but to make this really easy in a classroom environment, we just built the proxy capabilities right in. So people didn't have to spend a ton of time getting up and running on that. Um, so that's pretty much it in terms of getting started. Uh, we set the IP address, we set the port. If you want to use a proxy, which you're probably going to want to, um, you set the port of the proxy and done. Okay, um, let me just kill this service real quick. Come up. All right, and now we can go ahead and start that again. Okay, so now uh, we should be listening. Uh, so when you start the jar, it automatically also starts a listener on port 10,000, which is the way the wipe services are. Um, and then port, again, 12,000 is for the front end UI. Uh, so we have uh, default user, uh, username, password of both GoDroid. Okay, so we've set our destination info, and now all we have to do is hit the login button, and we should be hitting the web service. Okay, so you'll see immediately when you uh, log into the application, uh, you have two things. You have the remember me functionality. And then uh, once you log in, you get all this information back, including your authentication token that you're going to use for subsequent requests to the API. Uh, so as you can see, we have a couple different things here, um, check-ins, friends, rewards. Um, if you would actually dig into the code, you'd also see that there's some admin functionality. Um, and there may be some different ways you could potentially elevate to administrator, but I'll leave that to you guys to figure out on your own. Um, but one thing in particular we noticed, so we had that remember me functionality. So let's actually grab a shell on the Android device, and we're going to take a look at what that remember me functionality is actually doing. Um, so we're going to do ADB shell, which gives us a shell on the device. Uh, so now we can actually manage... Um, All right, so now we're inside the actual application's uh, data directory. So each application on Android um, within the CD uh, data app directory, you'll find the actual uh, APKs themselves, which is just an Android package. Um, within the data, data directory, you actually find the um, actual data used by the application. So, we take a look here um, at the share preferences folder and we're just gonna so we have a few different XML files here so if we take a look at the user info that XML file 
um, what do we notice here? So uh, we have the user's password in plain text, which is never a good thing. And we have remember me set to true. And if we go back and look at the actual code to do that, uh, I can find it. Go. Um, so you'll notice that at that remember me box is checked. Um, there's another check down here, so we'll hit you know uh, log in, check credentials. Um, that fires off an asynchronous task, which sends a restful, which sends an HP request to the web service. And we can see uh, down here, if Remember Me is enabled, then we run uh, Save Credentials. And if we look at Save Credentials, you can probably imagine what's happening. Um, we're just simply persisting the file to, uh, we're just simply persisting that information to a, to a Shared Preferences XML file. Uh, so you can actually see a couple problems. One, we're storing the password in plain text. Um, which you should always try to avoid that um, at any cost. There's generally a better way to do it than, than actually storing actual credentials. Um, you might want to just basically store a token um, or something else that's not, you know, going to actually, if someone gets access to that application and that data store, isn't going to actually get them access to other applications potentially. You always, at the very least, you want to limit the bleeding to your application. Uh, the other problem with it is that we also have this file as mode world readable. So the significance of this is that other applications, you know, for example, malicious applications, um, can actually also read that file as well, um, which is bad. So there's obviously ways for other applications to get to that. Um, in the event of a lost or stolen or compromised device, um, then that, that, that data also becomes accessible as well. Um, there are some potentially edge cases where other applications, um, you know, or even that application can actually uh, fetch that information remotely. Um, you might see that increase a lot, like for example, like in a phone gap application, um, where you have the ability to potentially call arbitrary methods um, using JavaScript. So you can actually do some pretty interesting stuff um, that also extends the potential reach of some of these vulnerabilities as well. Uh, let's take a look at another one. Um, there's, there's, there's definitely a lot more uh, bugs in here than I can ever get through in an hour. So again, I definitely encourage you to go back and uh, take a look at it on your own. Um, the next one is insufficient uh, transport layer protection. So if you noticed, uh, so we were able to run this through Burp uh, just fine. Uh, the problem with that is, uh, for those of you that are um, kind of a little bit more advanced here, uh, you'll, know, you'll, you'll come to the quickest realization that uh, the application completely ignored any certificate warnings. Um, for example, uh, the host name doesn't match, the CA um, isn't within the trusted uh, chain. Um, so a bunch of basically certificate errors were just gobbled up by the application and just, just silently basically ignored. Um, and there's a reason for that actually. Uh, so if we go and look at the main activity, so this is the first thing that gets fired off when the application starts. And you can see that within the onCreate method. So the onCreate method, as soon as an activity is invoked, um, the first thing it does in its life cycle is calls the, the onCreate method, or calls to the top, right? And um, you can notice the first thing that happens is we call this one particular method right here, um, SSL certificate validation got disabled. So if we go down here and we take a look at that disable method, you'll notice that um, within our uh, trust manager here, uh, we're just basically, just basically not doing anything, uh, returning true, uh, various different things happen. So we're not actually doing anything to prevent a man in the middle attack here, and we're not doing anything at all to actually alert a user that it's actually happening. So um, we call this method statically, and this basically, we call this before any other um, HTTP requests are made, and the significance of that is that uh, any subsequent requests are just simply going to inherit that um, setting where it just shuts everything off. So that's one potential place you might see that happen. Um, in the old code we had, uh, for example, down here, um, we created it with a custom SSL socket factory. And so you might see something like that as well. So you may see it uh, when you find this particular bug. You might see it one, you know, set centrally somewhere that's outside of your HP client class. 
Um, or then you might see in this example, like where we just basically passed um, that factory in there, and you can see down here um, we're essentially doing that same behavior, um, except we're just doing it, you know, a little bit differently. But same problem, different places to find it. Uh, so the obvious solution to this one is just, um, I mean, unless you're pinning your certificate and explicitly um, declaring which certificates are valid, um, you generally don't want to ever turn this off. Um, there's usually no compelling business reason other than the fact that um, you have a self-signed certificate and you didn't want to get one um, by, a, by a real CA, basically. Uh, but generally, nine times out of ten, there's, 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 there's no legitimate reason for anyone to do this in a production application. All right. Um, we'll take a look at uh, so client-side injection. So um, this stuff actually happens quite a bit. So XSS is actually, unfortunately, so we're grouping pretty much anything, uh, XSS, SQL injection. Um, we're just kind of lumping them all under client-side injection. Um, SQL injection, uh, I mean, not quite as dangerous as like a server side, but at the same time, there's um, certainly still some dangers of uh, SQL injection on Android. Um, but XSS is actually, and when we start talking about or start looking at like a phone gap application that's built on JavaScript, HTML5, and CSS, um, the prevalence and um, impact of these vulnerabilities are, are definitely elevated a little bit when your main way to access native functionality is through JavaScript. Uh, so we'll take a look at an example of actually both here. So um, if we look at the view profile here, uh, actually, we'll look at view check and activity. Um, so you can see uh, this probably is the worst way you can ever generate uh, HTML. Um, so basically, what we're doing is we're we're passing in uh, things from a bundle, uh, but which these things are. So for example, um, the venue name and all these other things that are set within the bundle. Those things are actually pulled from untrusted data. Um, so it's retrieved from the REST API. Um, so it's basically untrusted JSON data uh, stuffed into a bundle and then uh, from there concatenated into uh, HTML uh, that's passed into an Android web view. So kind of touching on a web view really quick, if we were to look at um, the resource file for this, which is just simply an XML file uh, with layout information. Um, Uh, so basically a web view, all it is essentially embedding a mini browser type of thing into your application. So um, it uses WebKit and you have access to the full DOM. Um, there's you know some obviously you know same origin type restrictions in place. Um, there's some you know I guess interesting rules that might you bend that to an extent. Um, but for the most part what you'd expect in a browser application is still there. Uh, so in this particular problem here, so we have a couple things. So, uh, so for starters, we've enabled a uh, JavaScript interface. So this mechanism allows you to uh, basically call native uh, methods uh, using JavaScript. So you can imagine, you know, the potential power, but at the same time, the potential danger of doing this. Uh, so in this example here, um, we are allowing the person to do calls to a JavaScript interface that also allows you to send SMS. So as you've probably figured out, uh, trigger this XSS will actually allow you, uh, and actually let you do it remotely at that, um, when someone actually you know, opens up the content, which this is actually within check-ins and comments. Uh, so it's one of those things that's it is the high likelihood that you're going to get hit with the stored XSS, and um, as soon as that person fires it off, uh, it's going to shoot an SMS message off on their behalf without any user interaction. Um, within newer versions of Android, uh, there's actually something really nice uh, within these JavaScript interface classes. Um, you can actually set an annotation uh, on a specific method that'll tell you that hey, this method is 
um, allowed for JavaScript. And so basically what happens is like developers will expose an entire class. Um, they may make all their methods public and they only intended for the JavaScript to actually call say you know one or two different methods within that class. Um, so in more recent versions of Android, um, by default, unless you actually tag it with the JavaScript interface annotation, then it won't actually be available within the JavaScript interface, which is a good thing. It's a good default to do. Um, talking about capability leaks, um, so just kind of give you a quick overview of the Android permission system. Um, so you have in Android, uh, you have application level permissions. So basically, if you declare send SMS, then the application can actually call different uh, APIs that uh, interact with, uh, you know, let you send SMS. If you don't have it, then Android, when you try to actually call that at runtime, Android will throw a security exception. Um, so you actually, like, in order to use these things, you actually need to declare these different permissions. Um, so some applications uh, actually allow uh, lesser privileged applications to potentially pivot and, you know, increase their permission level because they'll expose a, uh, a different component that doesn't necessarily require the same permission that it actually allows you to use. So uh, as an example here, um, we can take a look at the uh, send SMS uh, receiver, send SMS now receiver. Um, so if we take a look at this broadcast receiver here, Uh, we take a look at what happens. So when a broadcast is received, uh, it just simply grabs that. It grabs the information including the phone number and the message and it just sends off an SMS message. So uh, there's actually a few problems with this. So within here, you can clearly see that this allows you to send SMS. So you need the SMS permission to do it and if you have the permission, you can send the message. Uh, but the problem with this is that anyone that can actually call that uh, broadcast receiver um, so an application that actually has zero permissions uh, can send a broadcast to this application um, and tell this application, on behalf of me, send out an SMS message, even though you don't have the SMS uh, permission, uh, which is a problem. So the only thing that's actually required here is that you would use uh, this particular action. Uh, so actions don't require any permissions. Actions are part of the uh, intent resolution process, which really Android uses that to determine which is the best component to receive um, an intent. Uh, it doesn't really use that to uh, restrict it from a security perspective, um, because even though you know a specific action can be in place, you may you know, and um, it doesn't prevent you from explicitly invoking that, even if you don't hit it within the Android intent resolution process. Uh, there's only a few ways you can do that. Um, the biggest one, obviously, is uh, setting permissions. So um, if you would want someone to uh, hold a specific permission, then you would simply pass in uh, some dot permission to require, for example. And when you would actually try to invoke that uh, component, uh, if you didn't have the specific permission required, then Android would throw um, an exception that wouldn't allow you to actually leverage that. So uh, this is something really commonly encountered where you'll go from one privilege level to another just simply because the developers forgot to um, require permissions to happen. And by the way, you can also require permissions um, at the application level. So uh, each of the components in Android inherits from application. Uh, so each of these elements is always found under application. Um, so you can also at the application level uh, require permission and this is actually going to propagate down to all the other components declared in the application. Um, you could also set, for example, uh, some permission uh, here. And then down here, you could actually set a different permission if you want to. So at the very least, you can set um, an application-wide permission. Um, you need at least this to basically get in the door. Um, but then you could, of course, override that um, if you, you know, say, require a different permission um, or you want to be more granular for some reason. Um, some other permission here. And so what ends up happening is that if you declare a permission at the application level and at the component level, 
the one that's the code at the component level is going to take precedence over the one at the application level. So um, at the very least, depending on the kind of application you're exposing to other applications, um, you may want to consider setting it application-wide just as um, an initial uh, security boundary and then basically get more specific uh, where you need to. Um, it would actually save a lot of developers a lot of pain. Um, another thing also uh, a lot of developers don't realize, uh, so there's two different ways to expose one of your Android components. Uh, the first way is to explicitly do it, um, and we've actually done that here. So uh, what we've done is Android exported equals true, so uh, when you actually set this attribute, it's going to say that other applications can invoke that specific component in your application. Um, and then, of course, after that, it goes down to the permissions and all that stuff. Um, so that's one way to expose it, uh, is by explicitly doing it. Uh, the other way to explicitly expose a component is by setting any intent filters. Um, so again, an intent filter is there just basically to help Android figure out where it should be sending um, certain things. Um, but as soon as you expose an intent filter, uh, within a component, it's automatically exported at that point. So um, you have a couple options at that point. Um, you know, set exported equals false, and just you know make sure that it can't be exported, um, or you know be granular with permissions and checking who's calling it and so on and so forth. Uh, this actually represents, by the way, um, a significant portion. Um, we talk about components and IPC on Android. Um, it represents a significant portion of the Android attack surface. So um, if you're just getting started out with Android, for example, uh, I definitely recommend that you spend a lot of time getting familiar with uh, the various components. Uh, so you have uh, activities, broadcast receivers, uh, content providers, and services. Uh, so each of them actually has a slightly different uh, life cycle, uh, and the life cycle plays a huge role um, in the security of uh, a lot of those things as well. For example, there's certain things that you wouldn't want to do um, in like the activity on destroy, which would be like uh, clearing out sensitive files, stuff like that, um, because you're not actually guaranteed for that part of the life cycle to be called. Um, so if Android, you know, if you, your device, if you just pull the battery out, it doesn't happen. Um, if the application crashes, it might not happen. Um, so on and so forth. So there's certain things dependent upon the life cycle that you should or shouldn't do in there. So a good place to start is really learning the ins and outs of the Android uh, components. Uh, let's see, so we talked about capability leaks. Uh, the last bug we'll kind of hit at a high level, um, sensitive information disclosure. Uh, so another thing developers like to do uh, in Android applications, and mobile applications in general, um, is hard code various values within the actual binary itself. Uh, so in this example here, uh, so this is the login activity. So this is uh, what we saw before where we punched in our, our username and password um, is the initial uh, login activity. And what you'll notice is if you actually uh, dig down a little bit into, so from here, uh, we've sent our credentials off and then we handle the result of that in an on post execute method. And what you'll notice here that if we had a success, um, we want to check down here uh, so that we could either fire off the home activity uh, is what you saw here, for example. Um, and then there's also an admin home activity, which would actually have an additional um, icon there to give you, uh, give you access to admin functionality. Uh, so what you'll notice is that there's actually two ways you can actually invoke the, the admins. Excuse me. Um, one is that if that initial request um, and response when you logged in, uh, so if your is admin was set to true, then it's going to look for that in your shared preferences, um, which you should be able to see uh, over here, um, is admin equals false. Uh, so that's the first place it looks. And then the second place it looks is if you have a username of customer service and a password of account management, then it automatically uh, puts you into that as well. Uh, so the problem with this uh, is the fact that this is actually going to be available uh, to anybody that would actually download your application and attempt to reverse engineer it. Uh, so there's a ton of different tools out there that make it really, really easy to do this. Um, essentially what you're doing is going from uh, Galvic bytecode back to either you know human readable you know, Java form. So you can use Dexter jars one tool that allows that. 
Um, you can use Smiley Box Smiley. Um, it converts it to a Smiley format, um, which just basically makes the Dalvik bytecode readable. Um, so that's another potential way you'd be able to get to this. Um, so you can try to obfuscate all day, but um, I guarantee you that it's you know obfuscation is is going to end up being more of a um, kind of a speed bump as opposed to a roadblock. Uh, so if you're doing this kind of stuff, I would definitely, definitely, definitely recommend uh, not doing that because there's a, a fairly good chance that this kind of stuff is going to be recoverable by a bad guy. Um, so there's a lot of other, I know we kind of hit some of the high level bones here, um, but there's some other ones in there ranging from really simple to um, really, really, really complex. So for example, you may have to jump through um, an issue with a component being exposed to others, um, but you may actually have to use that to potentially jump into another component um, that may be hidden uh, or only available internal to the application. Um, so you may have to use that as a hopping point, uh, pivot, and then potentially carry another you know type of uh, attack. Um, so we've done a, a decent job at kind of you know showing how some of these things can be chained. Um, where one vulnerability potentially opens up, you know, four or five different other bones. Um, so there's a lot of issues within code. Um, there's some issues within uh, the configurations, uh, especially in the phone gap application. So uh, phone gap does a lot of nice things for you uh, when you uh, create an application out of the box. Um, so for starters, it enables uh, all these permissions for you. And PhoneGap is, uh, so it kind of works a little bit different than a native application. Um, so when you actually uh, start it, for example, um, so in your, in your initial activity, um, you'll extend DroidGap and then you basically load the start URL, which is set within a configuration file. Uh, the configuration files are under resources, config, uh, and under resources config, you can see, and this is actually like um, out of the box, uh, aside from adding a few different plugins, like it's for the most part exactly how PhoneGap creates an application for you. Um, so a couple things you'll notice uh, if you're looking at one. Um, these are all, aside from these things, these are all the default plugins that are automatically enabled for you, um, including the permissions, which includes geolocation, um, contacts, file, storage, um, these things let you get access to SQLite databases, to share preferences, um, to the contact list. Uh, so some really, really powerful capabilities are exposed um, via JavaScript, CSS, HTML5. Uh, so when you look at XSS, it's not um, as prevalent, I'd say. I, I go out on a limb and say it's not as prevalent in, in native applications, although it's there. It's definitely there. Um, but when you look at phone gap applications, I mean, this stuff is basically everywhere. So the out-of-the-box configuration um, potentially exposes all these different plugins to an attacker. Um, and I guess the kind of the cherry on top of that is PhoneGap is also given, uh, taking the luxury of setting this as a wildcard for you. Um, so basically what this says is that um, any domain is able to load JavaScript and execute it within the context of that application. So um, in a standard, you know, say browser type of application, um, you have some same origin model, you know, separation. So if you try to grab cookies, for example, um, of another domain and you load it from somewhere else, then it might not allow that. Um, but if you're storing that in, say, a shared preferences file and you're loading JavaScript from a third-party domain, um, and that, you know, says, hey, call this shared preferences file and read out whatever's in it and post it back. Well, that's probably a lot more likely because, you know, one, you've wildcarded it, and two, you have the, both the permissions and the plugins available to do it as well. Um, so the, the benefit of adding the phone gap application is to kind of give you a different perspective um, of, you know, basically native versus, uh, you know, mobile web application essentially. So now we'll just take a look at slides for a few minutes. Uh, so the project roadmap right now, let's talk about that. Uh, so here's kind of where we're at. Um, we definitely have a lot more in terms of the lessons we want to provide, but we're, we're probably closer to that than we were before. Uh, so the next, um, not going to probably be there in the 1.0 release, but um, hopefully not too long afterwards, we want to start distributing GoDroid as part of a virtual machine or 
a virtual machine that sets up the go to an environment. Uh, so we took a look at, for example, using you know the idea of using the Broken Web Apps project, and what we found is that basically Broken Web Apps does a great job at um, giving you a bunch of different vulnerable applications, but um, if you want to use it, say for example, to have your IDE SDK stuff, um, you know, basically all already set up in there and ready to go. Um, Broken Web Apps doesn't really give you a capability to do that. So uh, combined with things that we want to add to the application, such as which I'll talk about NFC support, um, it just made sense to basically start working on a distribution. Um, and so it's going to make it a lot easier for us to uh, push updates out um, along the way as well. But the benefit of obviously having a fully configured environment is that if you're using it in a classroom environment, um, people that are newer to Android, um, there's a little bit less of a learning curve in terms of getting everything set up. Um, so you could actually spend less time on configuration and more time on actually learning new concepts. Uh, we also want to expand beyond just uh, you know Java, Android, and um, PhoneGap. Uh, PhoneGap right now, by the way, is using uh, jQuery Mobile. Uh, we'd also like to support other JavaScript frameworks, other JavaScript UI um, stuff. Uh, additionally, uh, so people aren't just writing surprise, surprise their applications in Java and JavaScript. They're also using uh, .NET in the Xamarin project. Uh, there's actually people writing Ruby applications with Rubuto. And um, believe it or not, in our travels, we've actually seen some people starting to use Scala um, to write their applications as well. So over time, we hope to have enough code examples in enough different uh, languages and frameworks um, for you know, developers of all shapes and flavors to be able to look at the applications and um, you know, learn about what's actually relevant to the development environment they're working in. Uh, beyond that, so we want to use, start using uh, NFC, uh, Open NFC uh, for Android. Um, so as opposed to having a couple different NFC app, you know, uh, enabled devices talking to each other, um, to do it in a lab environment, uh, we, we want to alleviate you from actually having to you know, be able to do the wireless communications on real devices. Um, so the best way to do it is, uh, in our opinion, is using N Open NFC to do it. So um, within the next few versions, um, so after we get the initial VM off the ground, we should have that capability. Um, and in the next you know, couple iterations of GoTroy, we're going to start building out NFC exercises. So if there's any of you on the uh, webinar today that are really, really strong with NFC, um, we definitely love to have somebody you know, help kick in some cycles to build some of these exercises out. Um, so as we kind of wind down here, I uh, definitely want to thank uh, everyone that's, that's helped to date. Um, we've had a few code contributors. Um, we had a bunch of people that have contributed in terms of um, feature requests, in terms of reporting bugs, um, you know, recommendations for how to make it better. Um, it's definitely a community project. It's, it's all, again, it's open source. It's out there to be used as you want. Um, but yeah, it's certainly not going to go forward without people helping out. So thanks to everybody that's already helped. And thank you to those of you that are actually going to help going forward. Uh, so that takes us to the end of the uh, presentation. So if you want to grab the code, um, so the current uh, master branch is, is full of bugs. Um, they'll, they'll run, but uh, definitely plucking bugs out. So um, you've been warned about that. Uh, but it should be pretty stable pretty soon. Um, for more information about the mobile project, I'll also post the link there for that. Um, all the tools are there. And then you know, we also have the top 10 list. We have some stuff on security testing methodologies. Um, we're actually going through a re revamp of the top 10 now. We should be posting that stuff. Um, up there pretty soon. So I'd say keep your eye on the uh, mobile security project uh, on the wiki. And you know, last but not least, if any of you guys want to follow up with me, whether it's you know, questions about um, the existing code base, if you want to get involved in uh, being a contributor going forward, I mean, I'm happy to give anyone um, you know, basically push pull access to the repository. If you're, if you're serious about it and committed to, to committing code on a regular basis, I'm happy to give anybody access that wants to add something to it. Uh, so with that said, that uh, takes us to the end here. So if anybody has any questions, uh, I'd be happy to take uh, all of them now. Thanks, Jack. You did a fabulous job. I and mean, it kind of ran us right into time, so that's great. And I don't see any questions from the audience. That doesn't mean that they're not there. Um, to those who are listening, if you need confirmation of attendance for your CPE credits, um, you can send an email to support at os.org, 
and I'll be happy to send that out to you. Um, I also put Jack's email in the chat window, and if you found today's webinar helpful, um, it will be posted online, and it's also going to be shown again tonight at um, 9 o'clock Eastern Time. So if there are colleagues, coworkers that you think would benefit from listening to what Jack has to say, um, please encourage them to sign up for this afternoon's or for this evening's webinar. Um, so one last chance for questions. Did a great job, Jack. I'm sure you'll get inundated afterwards. All right. Well, thank you for joining, and um, keep. Keep your eyes peeled on the connector for future uh, webinar topics. Thanks. Have a great day.